meeting us here with your presence, with your spirit, and with your word. For loving us the way that you do and helping us to learn and grow so that we can be more like you. That's your desire for us. And so, Father, I pray that we would really learn, that we would grow, and that we would actually reflect you in a better way in every arena of our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, guys, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension to the Father, things were going great for Jesus' disciples. You remember, he had come, had um, uh, been here for 30 years, started his public ministry. Uh, that lasted for three and a half years. During that time, he called 12 disciples. We know the story. Jesus was, um, of course, crucified. He was our Savior. He cru was crucified. He died, but he resurrected. And after his resurrection, in case you didn't know this, he spent 40 days with his disciples talking to them about the plan that he had for them and about pr uh, propagating his message and sharing his love. So he spent 40 days with them and then he ascended to his father. And during that period of time, everything was going great for the disciples. Because after he ascended, the Holy Spirit descended. The disciples got a new spirit. They got, uh, you know, just as Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit descended on them filled them, and was transforming them to be more like Jesus. So during that time, they got a power to live. Can you say those three words? They got a what? A power to live. So things are going great, but not only did they get a power to live, they also got a new family. See, Jesus had said he was going to build his church. That was a community of believers. It hadn't existed yet. And before he left, he says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Well, after the Holy Spirit descended on the, the disciples, what ended up happening is a church began. And that was the church that God, Jesus was building. It was not just, not only did they get a power to live, now they got a place to belong. Can you say that out loud? They got a what? A place to belong. So it was beautiful. In the first three chapters of Acts, right after Jesus resurrects and is, is ascended, in the first three chapters of Acts, the disciples were growing personally, and the church was growing numerically. There was joy and excitement among, among all the new believers that had, were coming to Christ. It was surreal. Can you guys say that word? It was what? Surre it was like a dream. Much like when we first come to Jesus, when we first surrender our lives to Christ. I mean, when that happens, we are excited and overjoyed, uh, you know, that we have, can experience his healing and his help and his hope. I mean, guys, it generates a song in our heart and a spring in our step when we first come to Christ. How many of you are still feeling it, huh? How many? How many? Uh, can I hear somebody? Uh, uh, just a few. Uh, hey, before you leave, you'll get it, okay? Because during that period of time, we come to Christ, we have this new love, there's a, a, a new spirit that we're filled with, we belong to a new family, things are exciting, and then we get the fever. Everybody say, the fever! The fever. We get the fever. What fever, Pastor Dion? Well, we want to learn more. We want to practice what we learn from the Bible, and we want to promote Jesus. So every conversation, we want to bring him up. We want to talk about him. We want to learn about him. I mean, every church service, we want to attend. We want to get plugged in. We want to know more. So we get the Jesus fever. We also get, you know, the church fever. We, want, we, we start to adopt the church and attend church and appreciate church. It's a place where we come to get recharged and refocused. So we get the fever, right? How many of you have the fever, huh? Some of you? Hopefully, some of you do. Now, the thing is, after you get the fever, all hell breaks loose. Right? I mean, you start serving God, you're excited about your new faith, you're excited about a new family, you've got the Jesus fever, you've got the church fever, but then all hell breaks loose. Tensions, temptations, and troubles, they rush at us, you know, with extreme prejudice. You guys know what I'm talking about. 
In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 tells us why that happens that way. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, it says, dogs don't bark at parked cars. No, no, that's not what it says. But, but, but it's pretty close. It's pretty close. Here's what it says, 2 Timothy 3.12. Read it with me. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer, everybody say it, persecution. Oh. Yeah, you read it right. The minute we want to be Christ-like, the minute we want to go to church and learn more and practice what we learn about Jesus, the minute we do that, dogs start chasing us, don't they? Persecution and pressure and troubles and temptations, they all of a sudden, I mean, start flooding in. That's a good place right there to say, ay Dios mío. Everybody said, ay Dios mío. And if you're bilingually challenged, just say, OMG. Just, a, oh my gosh. Ay Dios mío. OMG is exactly what the guys in our passage that we're going to read, Peter and John, that's exactly what they said when they first encountered this persecution. Here's a little background. For those of you that weren't here last week, we kind of covered some of this. So here's a little background. Peter and John, Jesus' disciples, were on their way to church when they came upon a crippled beggar at the gate of the church. You see, the sick, diseased, and handicapped were considered unclean, and they were prohibited to go beyond the gate. So, you know, if, if you weren't sick or handicapped, you could go past the gate right into uh, the, the courts uh, where you were, could worship the Lord. But if you were diseased, sick, or handicapped, you couldn't go past the gates. It was a prohibition. You were considered unclean, and very possibly you were cursed of God. So you lived on the other side of the gate, which everybody considered far from God. And that's where Peter and John, they're going into the temple, and that's where they encounter this lame man. He's on the outside of the gate, far from God. Well, Peter had seen Jesus show compassion and heal people in that very area many times. During Jesus' life and ministry, he always, always reached out and helped people there. As he was walking into the temple, he would heal them. He would minister to them. He would serve them. Well, Peter saw Jesus do that. And Peter also knew that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead was now in him. So when he saw the crippled man, he wanted to mimic Jesus. He wanted to help people get closer to God just like Jesus did. He, Jesus would heal them and take them all the way into the place of worship. And Peter wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to mimic Christ. So Peter took the man by the hand, lifting him up, him up, and said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You could have probably heard a pin drop right then, right? The man who had been born crippled was immediately healed. Peter and John cheered and celebrated with him as they walked into church. Can you cheer and celebrate with them, guys? Can, can you? I mean, it was an obvious miracle. Whoa! Everybody said, whoa! whoa! The crowd was amazed, and they wondered who did this miracle, and how did they do it? Peter stood up, and he told everyone. He said, listen, this is how it happened. It wasn't me, it was, and everybody said his name. Jesus said, it was who? Jesus. Peter said, Jesus is alive. Peter told everyone, Jesus, it was Jesus who did this. He is alive. Faith in Jesus' name made this man walk. And then he told the crowd, and faith in Jesus' name can forgive your sins, can make you whole, can restore your relationships, can heal your hearts, and your hurts. Faith in the name of Jesus can help you with your troubles 
and give you grace. Man, it was a great two-minute, you know, all, that's all it was, two-minute little sermonette of Jesus' name and its power to be able to do all those things. Well, guys, the crowd was receptive. They, they heard it and, they, and they, they were soaking it in. The message was trending, as they say. Everybody's cell phone was getting notifications. Bing, bing, bing. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, it's, it, it's electric. Everybody's talking about Jesus. Everybody's talking about what has happened. Well, guys, many were making decisions for Jesus Christ, believing in Jesus that day at that place. But other people were getting, everybody say the word, disturbed. Say, say it kind of like with an ugly voice. Disturbed. So there are some people who are ecstatic, who are coming to faith in Jesus, but there are other people who are, say the word again, disturbed about it. In fact, that we are, Acts chapter 4 and verse 1. Here's what it says. Now, as Peter and John spoke to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly, everybody say the word, disturbed that they had taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about, everybody said, 5,000 people. So after Peter's just message, of after he healed the man and told everybody it was Jesus, and you can also be whole, 5,000 people received Jesus Christ, believed in Jesus Christ. At that moment, it was ecstatic. But there were other people who were disturbed. The religious leaders, you see, they had done everything in their power to silence the name of Jesus. I mean, they had slandered Jesus when he was alive. They murdered Jesus. And remember, they even paid the temple guards to lie that the disciples took the body of Jesus after his resurrection. They were trying to completely discredit the name of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and pretty much strike his name off of anyone's lips. The religious leaders had done that. They, and they at this point thought they, had, they were done with Jesus. I mean, it had been almost a couple of months. They're done with him. But now, Jesus' name has resurrected, has resurfaced through some transformed believers. The religious leaders... They came marching in, kind of like skunks with their tails up. You know, they're, they're huffy. All right? They're mad enough to eat bees, these guys. They're livid. And they come out, and they have Peter, John, and the ex-crippled guy, they have them arrested. The charge that they brought against them was this. Everybody said they were bringing what? That's what they said. You guys are spreading fake news. The Bible word is called heresy. They said, you guys are breeding, bringing and, and spreading heresy. That was the charge. But since it was evening, the courthouse was closed, the judges were gone, so they threw Peter, John, and the ex-cripple in prison and scheduled their trial or their stoning because that was the punishment for heresy. They scheduled it for first thing in the morning. So they basically said, hey guys, in the morning, we're going to go ahead and have a little trial and you'll be stoned. <laughs> and I mean with rocks, okay? I just throw that in there now. Yeah, everybody say, ouch. Everybody say, wow. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Listen, our new faith in Jesus and in church is going to disturb some people. Just like it did then. Our new faith, your new love for Christ and for church and for God's word is going to disturb some people. You know, aligning with Jesus will create some backlash. 
People won't throw rocks at you, but they will throw their disappointment, their disapproval, their disgust. You'll see it. Arched eyebrows, narrowed lips, crossed arms, you know, shaking heads. You'll sense the criticism, the ridicule, the rejection. It hurts. Everybody said what? It hurts. But we shouldn't be surprised because Jesus warned us that this would happen. In fact, John chapter 15, verse 18, here's what Jesus said. Read it with me. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as you were one of its own if you belonged to it. But you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. Oh. So you're going to get persecuted. Jesus said. And listen, persecution has a variety of faces. It has a variety of faces. Sometimes it looks like family members, friends, bosses, teachers, co-workers, classmates, persecution, troubles, temptations. They come from a lot of different areas. But there is really only one source of persecution, temptation, and trouble. And that source is from this guy. Everybody say his name. Who is it? The devil. The devil. Say it again. The who? So listen. Your trouble, your persecution, your temptation, all of it, I mean, it might have a lot of different faces, but it all comes from this guy. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're on a diet and you have a temptation for chocolate, that is not the devil. That is all you, all right? <laughs> but you know that there are some temptations, sinful temptations, that are pulling you away from God, that are causing you, uh, you know, uh, your relationship with God to be broken, to be crippled, to be handicapped. You know what they are, and they all come from one place. They might have a lot of variety of faces, bodies, but they all come from one place, and that is the devil. In fact, the Bible calls the devil our enemy, our adversary, our accuser. Oh, maybe you don't believe the devil's real? Just decide to live like Jesus and see what happens. Hmm? You'll find out there really is a devil. See, the devil is the instigator behind all the persecution, trouble, and temptation. And he has a reason for doing it. Jesus revealed the reason. It's in Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Here's what Jesus said. Some believers, read it with me, some believers have no roots. They have no foundation. So they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Wow. That's the devil's objective. That's the reason. The devil uses persecution, temptations, and troubles to wither our faith, to wither our witness. He throws punches in bunches to knock us down or knock us out. That is what he's after. Listen, if we have no roots, if we have no anchor, we're an easy win for the devil. Because without any roots or without an anchor, it doesn't take very much to knock us down. In fact, I brought an illustration today for that very reason. See, without an anchor, it doesn't take very much to put you down. Hardly any effort at all. The weakest, the weakest temptation, the weakest trouble, the weakest problem, the weakest persecution will put you on the ground. But, everybody say but. but. But, if we have an anchor, if we have a foundation, well, what is the foundation? Well, 
The Bible says that God's Word and God's Spirit creates a foundation in our life. Every time we come to church and we listen to God's Word, well, here's what's happening. We're pouring in the living water. We're pouring in into the foundation of our lives. Every time that you read your devotional book, every time that you download one of my teachings on the app and listen to it, Every time that you spend time in prayer, you come to church and listen to a message, you come to a small group here and, and learn something about Christ, you are pouring into your life the Spirit of God and the Word of God, and it's creating a foundation. Everybody said it's creating a what? A foundation. And see, with a strong foundation, here's what happens. You can put this on here, right? The, the enemy is going to come and he's going to try to hurt, harass, persecute, trouble, tribulation. He's going to try to hit you. And guess what? You didn't go down. I need the biggest, roughest, toughest guy here. Who's coming? John, come on up here. Come on up here, John. John Wickersham, part of our fire department. Go ahead and give him a cheer. You got the muscles. Come on, John. So here's what I want you to do. I'll come to this side. Just in case you're stronger than I think. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to give it the meanest punch. I mean, really do it. The meanest punch you can. With all you got. Give it. Go ahead. Knock it down. Go away. All right. That's OK. Give it the kick. A bigger kick. Thank you, John. Give it up for a fire department. Thank you, John. Listen. All that to say, if you pour into your life God's Word and God's Spirit, it creates a foundation in you. And that foundation will keep you from falling. If you've ever wondered why sometimes, or some people, I mean, they seem to fall every single time. They seem to go back to the same troubles. They seem to always get tripped up by the same stuff. There's your reason. There's no anger. There's nothing holding them up. There's nothing keeping them strong. There's nothing supporting them. There's nothing weighting them. You guys got that? So if, if you're here this morning and you have a Christian friend that keeps, you know, keeps drifting off and falling off the wagon or falling off this or falling off that, tell them, you got to get a stronger foundation. It's important. Because with a stronger foundation, with a strong foundation, you're not going anywhere. No, listen. You might get kicked, and you are. You'll get hit. You'll get punched. You'll get pushed. You'll, the storm will come. But you will not fall because you have a firm foundation. And that's exactly what happens with Peter in this situation. Peter and John are being confronted with persecution. But they have a strong foundation now. See, if we want to stay upright, we need to anchor ourselves with God's Word and God's Spirit. The Apostle Paul said it like this. If you want a different outcome, you know, because you keep doing this, trying the same thing and keep falling, if you want a different outcome, you should make some changes. Here's what he said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. He said, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, everybody, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is, instead of doing what you've been doing and falling over every time, how about you start seeking or searching the Scriptures to know God's will? And how about you stay full of the Holy Spirit? He said, this will make you strong and a resilient Christian. Isn't that sound awesome, guys, right? That's exactly what Peter did when he was under fire. Watch this. Those religious leaders came out. They, you know, came and threw them, threw them in prison. And it came to pass. They told them, tomorrow we're going to stone you. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers and elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them, Peter, John, and the crippled guy, in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? So, 
Peter, John, crippled guy are under the gun. They're brought out. After that long night in jail, Peter, John, and the ex-crippled guy are marched up to the Sanhedrin Council. They're placed in a hot box, and they're grilled. By what power and what name have you done this? See, the religious leaders don't even call it a miracle. By, how, by power, what power and what name have you done this miracle? They don't say that. Have you done this? See, if you remember, they had accused Jesus of doing miracles by demonic powers. So they're telling, they're insinuating that Peter and John might be doing it by demonic powers. In what name and in whose authority have you done this? So Peter and the boys are kind of staring down a loaded barrel there, huh? They're under the gun. Now keep in mind, this is the same courtroom, the same judges, and the same question that Jesus faced. And remember, they murdered Jesus because of his answer. So Peter might have looked, he'd been like a sweaty, you know, sweaty like a cat in a Chinese restaurant right then. Huh? 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 You know what I'm saying? Now, let's think about this. Peter is under the gun. The highest court in the land, all right, is questioning him the same question that Jesus got murdered over. Now, just a month earlier at Jesus' trial, Peter was outside, you remember? And he got identified and he punked out. He denied Jesus to a bunch of nobodies, servant girls and soldiers. I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anybody like that. I'm not from Galilee. I'm not one of them. No. You remember the story. Well, right now he's under fire a, to, from the Supreme Court. But this time, Peter did what Jesus taught him to do. Here's what Jesus had taught him. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. Jesus said this. Look, I'm sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. So be shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. But beware, for you will be handed over to the courts and you will be flogged with whips in the synagogue. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you're my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell others, I love it, uh, this will be the opportunity for to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. So when you're arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time, for it's not you who will be speaking. It will be the Spirit of your Father. Well, you know, Peter, before he punked out, before he ran away, the last time Peter was under fire outside of Jesus' trial, he cut loose with cursing and swearing. His bad attitude and foul mouth turned people away from Jesus. But now he's a different man. He's transformed. In fact, let's listen to the change. What Peter, how Peter responds. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you, talking about Jesus. This was the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness, this is the rulers, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So, Peter's under the gun. They have him in the hot box. But instead of caving, instead of punking out, 
Peter is a changed man, and he explains. Now, the Sanhedrin council was amazed. Everybody say the word, what? Amazed. See, they had killed Jesus, but Peter and John sounded and acted exactly like Jesus. What a compliment. Everybody say, what? What a compliment. Under fire, in this persecution, in this stressful situation, and people are saying, they sound and act just like Jesus. Listen, we pick up people's habits and attitudes the same way we pick up their colds. By exposure. Everybody say it out loud. By what? By exposure. See, the longer we are exposed to a person, the more we'll pick up from them. Their prejudices, their philosophies, their idiosyncrasies, their weird OCD things. Heck, we all know couples that even start to look like each other after they've been with each other for a while. Everybody say, weird. Right? I look out at some of you and I see couples. Yeah. Yeah. We start picking up their, their, their stuff, their, their habits, their actions. We start looking like them. So who are you sounding, acting, and looking like? Your parents? Your spouse? Your co-worker? Your best friend? Are you acting, looking, and sounding like your favorite TV, you know, celebrity? Archie Bunker? <laughs> Angelica Pickles? Dr. House? Or Newman? Huh? Hopefully we're becoming more like Jesus. So Peter, you know, the, the, when they say these guys, are, they, they've spent time with Jesus. Peter answered the religious leaders' questions. He said, you're asking, by what power and what name have, have, have we done this? By what power and what name have we helped this man? He said, in the saving name of Jesus. That's how we've done it. That's the name that we're under. That's the banner we're flying. It's in the name of, and everybody says name, Jesus. And Peter tells them, there is no other name that has the power to save, to heal, and to deliver. No other name at all. You know what I'm saying? Caesar, you know, uh, Allah, the Dalai Lama, you know, none, none of them. Jesus is the only name that has the power to save, to heal, and to deliver. Peter said it's in Jesus' name that this man has been made whole. And guys, like I told you last week, people can argue your beliefs, they can debate your convictions, but it's impossible to deny the evidence of a changed life. It's impossible. They can, you know wave their hand and reject or deny your beliefs and your theology, but one thing they cannot deny is the evidence of the changed life that they see in you and they see uh, uh, around you. They can't deny that. And that's exactly where the, the, the rulers are. You know, they, they can deny what Peter and John are preaching, the name of Jesus. But they can't deny the evidence that's standing in front of them. A man who was born lame is now walking and is in the temple singing and praising and shouting. Is actually standing before him in the hot box. I mean, I wonder what this guy looked like just standing there like, you know, oh my God, I, I just got legs and now they want to kill me. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but they're, they're, they're saying, I mean, you know, uh, you can't deny that. So here's what, here's what they do. The religious leaders called for a recess. They, they want to talk with each other off the record. Now, I don't have time to read the rest of the passage there in the book of Acts, but here's the gist of what the, the, the judges come back with. They come back with a judgment. And here's what they tell Peter and John and the crippled man. They said, we can't stop you from believing in Jesus' name, but... Here's what they told him. Everybody said out loud, keep it to yourself. That's what they said. 
We can't stop you from believing in Jesus, but we're telling you to keep it to yourself. Has someone ever demanded that of you? To keep your faith and your Jesus to yourself? Maybe an unbelieving spouse, supervisor, sibling, or some group? Have they threatened to leave you, to fire you, to disown you? Kind of like the one woman, I remember the story where, you know, uh, she, was, she was a Christian and she's going to church and she's always going to church every time there was church. And, you know, she, was, she had the fever and she was going and her husband wasn't. He hated it for her to go every time. And so one day he pulled out a gun and he stuck it in her face, um, you know, when she was on her way out to church. And he says, what are you going to do now? He said, well, you pull the trigger. I go to heaven. You don't. I'm going to church. <laughs> So if you've ever been pressured, told, keep it to yourself, you've ever been bullied or, or in that situation, you're in good company. You're persecuted for your faith. You're in good company. Jesus' family called him a lunatic. The priests called Jesus a heretic. The ho the, Jesus' homies wanted to throw him off a cliff outside of you know, his, his town. Jesus' enemies wanted to stone him in the street. But Jesus kept sharing and shining and serving. Isn't that awesome, guys? I'm going to say it again. In all of that, and this is pretty important, guys, if a northern New Mexico kid like me is, is saying this, Jesus continued to share, shine, and serve. Ah. Because it's what we're supposed to do. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says this. It's what we're supposed to do. Read it with me. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Ah, let's not get past that so fast. <laughs> let's read it again. Here we go. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Keep on shining, that's what he's saying. No matter what. No matter how dark it is. So when the Leaders tell them, hey, listen, we can't stop you from believing in Jesus' name, but we're telling you to keep it to yourself. Peter and John respectfully disagreed with the religious leaders that day. We, they said, we don't think it would be right to keep Jesus to ourselves. In fact, we're pretty sure God wants us to, God wants us to let the whole world know about Jesus. We're pretty sure, they said. That is awesome. Persecution is the devil's attempt at silencing you. Remember that. Trouble, temptation, persecution is the devil's attempt at silencing you, at scaring you. Stand your ground. Say it out loud. Stand your ground. Look at your neighbor and tell him that. Stand your ground. And hold on to this verse. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Yes, the Lord is for me. He will help me. And let those who hate me beware. <laughs> All that to say this. It's the last quote for the morning. Here it is. Let's say it out loud. If God is for us, who can be against us? Say it again. If God is for us, who can be? There it is. Did you learn something this morning? Yes. Wonderful. Now listen. If you're here this morning and you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, 
your life hasn't been filled with joy and peace and fullness. And you want that for yourself. You know that you are far from God, kind of like that crippled guy. But you want to be closer. All that it takes is just a step or an act of faith to say, Jesus, I believe that you can help me right where I am. He's holding out his hand to grab a hold of you. If that's you, would you raise your hand with me and say, that's what I want, that's what I need in my life? I see them. Beautiful. Made the best decision of your life. Let's all stand so we can pray. Let's pray out loud together. Father, I know I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I've ignored you. I've run from you. I've even fought you. But today, today I surrender. I repent for my sin and I turn to you. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And wash me. I believe in you. And I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that act of faith alone cleansed everything inside. A new spirit, the Bible says, is born in you. And you belong to a new family. I know, go ahead and look at them. They're, they're a little sh shady, but, but, but look, but, 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 but they're in process. Because, hey, listen, none of them are where they should be, but none of them are where they used to be. Something's happened. So listen, before you leave this morning, at the close of this next song, if you prayed that prayer, there will be some leaders standing up here. They have Bibles and materials they'd love to give you. Take advantage of that. They might even ask your name and your phone number. You might be a little reluctant because you don't know them, but listen, they want to text you a few verses of Scripture. They want to pour into your life so that your foundation can build. Because now that you've become a Christian, now that you've put your, your eyes on Christ, all hell is going to break loose around you. Drugs will be free. You'll be invited to every Christmas party in the world. You know, to come and do what you do. Propositions will be made. You need a foundation. And the only way to stay strong. So give them your telephone number. Give them your name. Let them pour into you. I promise they won't harass you. I'll send you a text. I'll send you a few verses of scripture. It's the way we stand strong. So take advantage of that. For the rest of you, they'll be up here to pray with you. Maybe you're going through a, pers a persecution, a trial, a temptation, a troubling time right now. Maybe you just you kind of feel like your foundation hasn't been strong enough and you keep, you keep crashing and burning. The folks up here will pray with you. They'll share some scriptures with you. They'll pour into you. To build that foundation. So take advantage of it. The Lord bless you. And the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you. And give you peace. May the beauty of the Lord be upon you. And may he establish all the works of your hands. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. We'll see you next Sunday. I love you guys.